الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن استنى بسنة إلى يوم الدين Our praise is due to Allah May Allah's peace and blessings be on his last Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day The topic, as my brother mentioned, concerns the commitment of the Muslim to Islam. A commitment which has to be based on correct or the correct principles of Iman or faith. And this commitment is particularly relevant to us here. Most of us, as I can see, are people who have emigrated from different parts of the Muslim world to America. We have left communities of Muslims and come to a community of Kuffar. That is North America, a community of disbelievers. We left our countries, whether Sudan or Pakistan, Somalia, Egypt, Libya, Turkey. All of these countries, though for the most part they were not Islamic countries in the sense that Allah's law governed the lives of the people of those lands. However, the majority of people in these countries were Muslims. communities of Muslims. And to leave a community of Muslims, to go and live in a community of non-Muslims is abhorrent, despicable, ruled by scholars to be haram, fundamentally haram. forbidden, sinful. Unless one has a justification. For most of us, we came here to get a piece of the American pie. That's the reality. We weren't satisfied with the Pakistani pie or the Egyptian pie. We wanted something of that American pie. So, we left our land and we came here. This hijra, this emigration, this journey, for the dunya is a sinful journey. If we came here for the sake of Allah, to spread the word of Allah, to enlighten this nation that is in a state of darkness due to their lack of knowledge about Allah, then this would be a blessed journey, one for which Allah has many rewards. However, the reality is that for most of us, we didn't come here for that purpose. We have, however, an opportunity. We're still living. Death has not caught us. 
we are still alive, we have an opportunity. As long as we are living, we have an opportunity to repent. Tonight is one of the odd nights of the last ten nights. No? The even night? Okay, it's the even night. Depending on when you fast, the very fast. <laughs> okay. It's one of the nights of the last ten nights. Among which is the night of power, that is in other. Worship in that night is worth the worship of a thousand months. Something worth striving for. We don't know exactly when the night is, so that we would make a greater effort. We don't just choose one night. Some people have said it's the 27th already. So maybe they don't pray all the while about until the 27th. But this is not really the case. It is a night. It is a night of opportunity. These nights, these last ten nights, are nights of opportunity. Beginning with tonight, we have a chance to gain a mighty reward which Allah willing will help us to repent for the sin of coming here for the dunya. The sin that we are carrying all these years. Being here for the dunya. And this sin if it is erased by our repentance during these nights, beginning with tonight, then we have to change our intention. If we want to remove the sin, then we have to change our intention. We are here now. There are people here who don't know what Islam is. Whether Muslim in name or none. It is our duty therefore to strive to take the message of Islam to them. If we change our intention for being here to one in which we seek to please Allah during our stay, our brief stay here, which can end tonight. We can walk out of here after Tarawish and have a car accident. And it can be all over tonight. If we want to make a difference, if we want to make a change, then we can change our intention and what comes from here on in will be reward for every day that we spend in this land. If we make the intention to live here in the Salati, wa nutuki, wa mahiyaya wa manati, lillahi rabbil alami. We make our Salah, the sacrifice of our wealth, our time, for the pleasure of Allah, the whole of our life, our living and our dying for Allah. If we do that, then we are rewarded for our failure. If we don't do that, not only are we in sin for having come here for the dunya, but we carry an even greater sin, the sin of hiding the truth, hiding the message which was brought by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Hiding that message is a curse. It brings us the curse of Allah. 
and his angels and all of mankind, the curse will be on us. As Allah said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْتُمُونَ مَا أَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْلَيْجِنَاتِ وَالْهُدَى مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا بَيَّلْنَاهُ لِلنَّاسِ فِي الْكِتَابِ أُولَئِكَ يَلْعَنُهُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَلْعَنُهُمُ اللَّعِنِ There is those who hide what we have revealed of the clear messages and the guidance after it has been made clear to people in the scriptures, in the Quran, those are cursed by Allah. And they are cursed by all who curse. The curse of Allah is hell. When Allah curses a man or a woman, it means that they're headed for hell. Serious. Hiding the message of Islam is a very serious sin, a major sin. Any sin which is going to carry you to hell is a major sin, a mortal sin. That's the choice that we have here. Those who have made it Either we fulfill our responsibility of carrying the word of Allah to those around us who are ignorant, whether on our jobs, on the buses, our neighbors, our friends. We have that job. بَلِّغُ عَنِّي وَلَوْعَيَةً This statement of God from Allah a command to convey whatever we have of Islam, even if it is only one verse. This statement underscores the curse of Allah for those who do not carry the message. So it's not much of a choice, really. We only have one option. It's paradise, not help. We don't want help. We want paradise. If we want paradise, then we must commit. We must commit ourselves to carrying that message, the message of Islam. If we do that, then every minute of every day, we are gaining blessings, rewards from Allah. That is His promise. However, for us to be able to carry the message, after committing ourselves to it, we must know it. Commitment, we understand theoretically, intellectually, that we need to commit ourselves because we want paradise and not hell. However, the next step requires that we find out what is the message of Islam. We have to learn our Islam the same way if we decide to start a business, we have an idea of a goal, we want to have a successful business. Then we study the market. We make a feasibility study and we purchase the necessary uh, equipment, uh, hire the right people. You know, we, we plan, we study, we're very serious, dedicated when we want to have a successful business. But when we want paradise, what are we doing? Allah is the most perfect. When you do anything, Allah is most merciful. No. You have to plan. We have to study. We have to take Islam seriously. We have to learn it. The Prophet Muhammad he told us 
They left two things with us. The Quran and the Sunnah. If we hold on firmly to them, we will never go astray. It's clear, very clear. No. So we need to know the Quran. And we need to know the Sunnah. This is the foundation of our faith. Islam is not what we did back in Cairo or Islamabad or Mogadishu. Some of what we did there may have been Islam, but to say everything that we did back there was Islam, no. No. There are many things that people are doing which have nothing to do with Islam at all. People have accepted it as being the way of the Muslim people, the culture. But when we actually judge it according to the Quran and the Sunnah, we find that much of it has nothing to do with Islam. Some of it comes from pagan cultures that are around us, or were carried down to the generations by those who initially accepted Islam. They carried with them some baggage from their pre-Islamic time, and it was never cleared away. So we have to tackle this seriously. Find out what is Islam. It means that we have to read Quran not as a ritual. Those of us who come from lands where we don't learn Arabic as a language, but we learn it just to recite the Quran. As well as those people who have Arabic as a language, but when they recite the Quran, they do it for the blessing of the reputation. You find people from both groups who take the Quran during Ramadan or maybe outside of Ramadan and they will busily recite it. However, if you ask them after they finish reciting what they recited, they will be hard pressed to tell you what it was there. Either because they didn't know what the Arabic words meant anyway, they didn't know Arabic, they just knew how to pronounce the letter. Or because their minds were not on the reputation anyway. They were just concerned with, you know, they have a juice to read and they're reading their juice. Get over with it as quickly as possible. So they're reading at, you know, 90 miles an hour. Nothing is going in the head. It's just their mind is something else. They're planning for whatever after they finish reading they have to go to work and This is not the way. This is not how we are supposed to treat the Quran. It is mistreatment of the Quran. This kind of mistreatment will turn the Quran and our recitation of it into a curse against us on the day of judgment. If we are going to read the Quran, then we should read it with understanding. Better in Ramadan that you read one surah understanding what it is Allah is saying to you in that one surah than to read the whole Quran not having understood anything that you read. Be sure. Be sure that even if you read one verse, one single verse, and you reflected on the meanings, understood it, and tried to make it a part of your life, that that is worth more than reading through the whole Qur'an from Al-Fatiha to an nas without understanding what you're reading. This is something we need to reflect on seriously because so many of us are caught in the ritual. We are caught in the ritual. We are doing things automatically. After the Salah, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said, after the prayers that we should say Subhanallah 33 times, Alhamdulillah 32 times, Allah Akbar 32 times, or 34 times. But what was the intention here? Was it the exercise of our fingers and our tongues? Is this what the intention was? 
the TV people sitting there. <laughs> trying to get over as quickly as possible so they can get out of there. Useless. Useless. We have to be careful. We don't train and teach our children. That's nonsense. It's nonsense. It's a joke. Shaitan has got us. What we think is some kind of action which is going to bring us some reward. No, it's something Shaitan is stealing from us. Instead of getting reward from it, we're getting nothing. Then do you say Subhanallah one time? Think about what it means. Then 33 times and you don't know what you said. Be sure. This is how Islam is. The numbers, it's not in the numbers. Ultimately, it's not in the numbers. See, people get caught up in this idea of numbers, you know, like as the people who calculate, okay, land of a thousand months of worship. One night. A thousand months, how many years is that? How many years? Eighty-three years and four months. That's a lifetime. So, if I can catch Lila to I will need to pray for the rest of my life. <laughs> One prayer in Mecca is worth a hundred thousand prayers elsewhere. You get out your calculator and get a figure now. A hundred thousand prayers. How many prayers can you make in a, in a lifetime? If you live for seventy years, Praying five times a day, what does that add up to? It doesn't reach a hundred thousand. So one prayer in Mecca, you don't need to pray again for the rest of your life. No, it's not, it's not in the numbers. A person who goes to Mecca with that kind of intention, be sure that he gets nothing for that prayer. The one who stays at Lala to Qadr trying to catch that one night so he doesn't have to pray for the rest of his life, be sure he gets nothing for that prayer. Because it's not in the numbers. It is in the sincerity with which we pray. This is what it is. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, فُدْعُ اللَّهِ وَأَنْتُمْ مُوْقِنُونَ بِالْإِجَابَةِ Call on Allah, pray to Allah, believing sincerely and surely, certain, with full certainty, that He is going to answer your prayers. وَعَلَمُوا But at the same time, know أَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَسْتَجِي دُعَاءً مِنْ قَلْبٍ غَافِلٍ لَا Know at the same time that Allah does not answer the prayer of a heart which is Neglectful, playful, in a state of ignorance, a dua is made, a call is made to Allah, but it is just a ritual act. Allah does not answer it. Allah doesn't answer it. That advice from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is very, very, very deep. Because he's telling us that all of our worship is useless unless it is coming from a conscious heart. And he used to seek refuge. Allah in the A'udhu Bika Min Qalbin La Yaksha O Allah, I seek refuge in you from a heart which does not fear. Fear has to be there. That's a dead heart. The dead heart leaves a man or a woman going through a tour which will not take us anywhere but to hell. That's real. And it's very, very important for us to grasp it. Otherwise, we're just wasting our time. So our commitment to Islam, our commitment to Islam means that we have to do whatever we do of Islam 
with full sincerity. Really from our hearts, knowing Allah, committed to the obedience to the law of Allah. This is the true worship of Allah. This is what Allah wants from us. That's what He needs. He doesn't need. We need. We need to worship Allah in that way so that our worship will do what it is supposed to do for us. In the Salah Tanha and Salah prevents evil speech and evil deeds. How many people making Salah yet speaking evil and doing evil? What does this mean? It means the Salah is useless. It is not of any value. So if we pray if we make salah with the kind of heart which fears Allah, then our salah will purify us of our evil. We will come back from salah feeling changed, refreshed, revived. Some of them used to say to Bilal, Arishna salah. Call the event so we can take rest in our prayer. Find some peace. For us, the prayer is a burden. Getting up for Fajr is a struggle. We try to pray and get it over with as quickly as possible. Where's the rest? Where's the peace? Allah bi zikr Allah tasma'in al qulub. Where is the rest? Where is the peace? It is only with the remembrance of Allah that hearts find rest. The remembrance of Allah, this is the salah. As well as all of the actions of Islam. But it is primarily the salah. Akin is salah li zikri. Establish the prayer for my remembrance. So our salah has to be one in which we are motivated, we are remembering Allah. We come out of the prayer, remembering Allah means remembering the evil that we have done. Prior to that prayer, the evil that we have thought to do, that we have spoken about, that we have acted upon. We remember Allah in that prayer and we ask His forgiveness for that evil. And we strive on coming out of the prayer from returning to that evil. This is the commitment. This is the prayer. And the Prophet Muhammad has given us no end of guidance concerning our prayer and our different acts of worship. With regards to making our intentions purely for Allah. He has advised us that if we have a desire to go to the bathroom, we should not go to prayer. Go to the bathroom. Most people, if they hear the Adam, the Ali Akama, people are making Salah, Maghrib, they feel they go to the bathroom, they don't want to miss Maghrib. They don't go and pray Maghrib with a desire to go to the bathroom. They have not understood. In their minds, your mother is more important than you go to the bathroom. That's why I pray in Jama'ah and get it over with, then I go to the bathroom. No. Because if you go to the bathroom, if you go to mother with a desire to go to the bathroom, what's going to be on your mind during your prayer? Instead of thinking about Allah, you're thinking about, you know, holding yourself and going to the bathroom. So what's the value of that prayer? You're destroying your prayer. This is why Prophet Muhammad S.A.W. advised us these things. So that we can give the prayer, give our acts of worship full consciousness. And where do we get these pieces of information from? This is from the Sunnah. That's why we must 
study the Sunnah. We have to read the Hadith collection, the authentic collection which describe the prayer and the things about the prayer, how the Prophet made his prayer and their companions, etc. So we can get a good picture of what is required of us. So we will not be caught up in the mistakes that have come down to us, inherited by us from our culture. On one occasion a man came into the masjid, the Prophet was sitting with a group of his companions. When he came to the masjid, he made two units of prayer, what we now call Tahiyyat al-Masjid, in obedience to the Prophet command, إِذَا دَخَلَ أَحْدُكُمْ الْمَسَاجِدِ فَلَا يَجْلِسْ حَتَّى يُسَلِّمُ رَكْعَتَيْنِ If any of you enters a masjid, do not sit down until you have prayed two units of prayer. Important. So important that the Prophet ﷺ, during the khutbah of Jumu'ah, a man came in and sat down. And he stopped the khutbah and asked the man, Did you make your two units of prayer? before sitting down, and the man said, no. And so he said, get up and make your two units of prayer. He stopped the hook, but he said, that. So, the man who entered the mansion, he made his two units of prayer. As the Prophet said to us to do. Then he came over and he sat down by the group. But before he could sit down, the Prophet told him, go back and pray that he did pray. So the man went back and he made two more. When he finished, he came to join the circle again. The Prophet told him, go back and pray because he didn't pray. Ah, the man went back and he did two more. When he was finished, he came to sit down and the Prophet told him, go back and pray because the Prophet is with him. I don't know any other prayer but this one that I'm doing. Could you please tell me what I'm supposed to be doing? So the talk comes out and I'm told him. But when you stand for prayer, you must stand and pray until all of the bones fall into place. And when you bow, you bow and settle until all of the bones go into place. And when you go down to sujood, same one. You settle there until all of the bones went into place. That there is a pause with each action that you make. He told the man that why? Because when the man came in the matches, he was making a prayer like we see people do even till today. They come in and you see them. They make a long walk bus, and from the time the hand goes, they're going into the core. And coming back up again, they're going down into sujood, no pause. It's just like a fluid, you know, in and out. And you see people making sujoods, and I've observed certain people from certain parts of the world, they'll make two sujoods without sitting back up. They'll go down one, two, and then they're going back up again. They don't realize this is not counted. This is not sujood. And sujood is one of the arcane of salah. One of the principles of salah. You drop it out of salah, you are no salah. You could. If you make two sujood without sitting back up again, you're back up to this position. You went like this. That is not counted. And your salah becomes invalid. It's not true. So the Prophet guided the man to a principle of salah. That there be a pause with each of the actions. The pause is necessary for us to be able to reflect on what we have to say. Think about it. Because if you went to to do it like this, now you know each time you make sujood you're supposed to say Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la two times. What speed would you have to say it to be able to make two sujood like that? The speed of light means it's useless. 
totally useless. First fulfill what should have been said or what should have been done. A useless prayer. So as the thought of them told the man to go back and pray because what he did was not prayer. That is what many of us have inherited from our land, our country culture. Many people pray like that. Not knowing the meaning of prayer. People will give more importance to zikr. You will see people working on zikr. After the prayer is over, they may sit and swing and stand and lean and, you know, really working on zikr. Right? Remember it, Allah, Allah, Allah. But the prayer is just lightning. So, how do we know? How do we know that it shouldn't be like that? We know by reading the books of the Sunnah. By going back to the source of Islam. Finding out what did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have to say about Salah. What is the guidance that he had to give? Collect that guidance and implement it. With that sincerity, that sincere commitment and then the Salah become a means of purification for us. Purifying us of our sins. That's why Prophet Muhammad said that from one Salah to the next erases the sins in between. This is that Salah, the real Salah. That's the one that erases it. He said that when a person makes wudu properly, with each drop of water that comes from his hands, etc., the sins are dropping off him. This means a special kind of wudu. And this is not a secret. You know, some people might want to tell you that this is a secret wudu. There are some secret words that you need to say to make this kind of wudu. And only we know it. You have to join our group to find out the secret words. No. We don't have any secret words here. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi told us, Taraktukum ala mahajjitin bayla. I've left you on a clear white sheet. Lehu haka na'ariya. It's mighty such a day. La yazir wa anha illa halik. Anyone who deviates from this, forming his own special little club with special words, he deviates into destruction. Islam is clear. No secret. There was no special things that Prophet Muhammad said to Abu Bakr when they were in the cave. You know, people have a little fairy tale that they made up. They said, you know when Abu Bakr was in the cave with, with Prophet Muhammad The Prophet Muhammad he revealed to Abu Bakr some special things. He never told anybody else. And Abu Bakr, he handed it on to so and so. And so and so handed it on to this one, to that one, till it came to my shaykh. My shaykh has that secret message which the Prophet gave to our son and to our Bakr in the cave. Nonsense. It's lies. The message was a clear message. No secret. No shortcut. Because that's what all these secrets are. Shortcut. You want to go to Canada? You don't need to do all these five times daily prayer and all. We have a shortcut here for you. You just say these special words and you do these special things and they get to paradise. Believe me, if they take it to hell. That's what it is. Shaitan has got you. If you believe you have a special way to paradise, which the Prophet Muhammad did not tell the rest of the nation, then I'm telling you that Shaitan tricked you. And you are going on a path to hell. There are no shortcuts in Islam. The path is a difficult path. It is a struggle against our desire for shortcuts, for the easy way. The Prophet said that hell is surrounded by the pleasurable things to our desires. And paradise is surrounded by the things we don't like. Getting up for fajr. 
What is pleasurable to us is to sleep on. Shut the alarm off and take some more. What is difficult is to fight it and get up. One is the path to paradise, the other one is the path to hell. No shortcuts. Beware of shortcuts. In Islam, there are none. The way of Islam is very clear. It is explained by the Prophet Muhammad in his sunnah, in his words and in his actions. He has explained carefully for us the way to paradise. And beware of anybody who comes with a new way, a new way which he claims that the Prophet told him in a dream, you know. Beware, because the Prophet Muhammad before he died, he said very clearly to his companions, مَا تَرَكْتُ شَيْئًا يَقَرِّبُكُمْ إِلَى اللَّهِ إِلَّا وَأَمَرْتُكُمْ بِهِ I didn't leave anything which will bring you closer to Allah except that I commanded you to do it. Every way, every act, every saying, every word which is pleasing to Allah, which will help us to get closer to Allah, the Prophet Muhammad has told us. Nobody to bring any new one. It's complete. The religion was complete with the Prophet Muhammad No secrets, no shortcuts, no new ways. One way. So, for our own sake, on this blessed night, among the nights of Ramadan, let us try to renew our commitment to Allah. To seriously search ourselves and question what kind of Islam have we been practicing to this point? Has it been real Islam coming from our hearts? Or has it been ritual Islam where our limbs have gone through different motions and movements but our hearts were elsewhere? And let us try in the remaining prayers of the night to make these prayers real prayers to Allah and take the benefit. The great additional blessings which the Prophet has promised us for staying up in prayer with the Imam. Let us not allow this opportunity to escape us. Let us not allow any opportunity after this to escape us. Every prayer that we make, every fast that we do, let us strive in this month and in the months to come to make our Islam a living faith, a faith which will purify us of our sins and will earn for us paradise. Let us try it. Let's just strive for it. It doesn't mean that with the slightest effort everything comes. As I said, it is not an easy task. It is a path that we have to struggle with and strive for. We have the rest of our prayer to make, and so I hope that you would do it with the kind of commitment that I'm sure you all know is necessary, and that you would strive in the rest of the day and evening of Ramadan to read the Quran with the kind of consciousness that will benefit us from our reading. And that we also strive to avail ourselves of the sunnah, to be exposed to the implementation of the Qur'an, the living Qur'an is the sunnah. 
I know some of you have some questions you'd like to raise, but the administration has a program which needs to be fulfilled. And for the sake of those people who have other commitments, etc., let us now complete our prayers. And after the prayer, inshallah, I will sit for, you know, some 15 or 20 minutes and answer uh, or discuss with you certain other points that perhaps you would like to ask about and discuss. I praise you to Allah. May Allah peace and blessings be the last messenger of Allah. Surah Al Mukminun. The last verses which our brother read. Allah has advised us. Seek refuge in Him. That's the Shaytan. That's the Shayateen. Upon Rabbi, I will be the king of the Shayateen. Shaytan, who has dedicated himself to pull each and every one of us off the path off the path to hell Shaitan who has with him companions for among the jinn and among mankind Shayateen whom the Prophet Muhammad described on one occasion to his companions by drawing a line in the dust and drawing certain lines going off on either side. And he asked the companions if they knew what it was that he had drawn in the dust. And they said, Allah and the Messenger of the And he responded that the straight line she drew, this was the path to paradise. And that the lines which he drew on either side, like the veins of a leaf, that these were paths heading to hell. And at the head of each path is the devil, Shaitan, calling to that path. And Shaitan calls <coughs> in many, many different ways. And as such, Allah has warned us and has advised us to seek refuge in Him from the prodding of the devil. The prodding which ultimately can lead us to Him. And Allah goes on in these verses to speak of those who are caught by death unaware. حتى إذا جاء أحدهم الموت قال رب ارجعون Those who have succumbed to the prodigies of the shayateen the devil and Allah catches them because Allah doesn't take our lives when we have decided that it's time to die He takes our lives at the time when we are least aware, at least when we least expect it. And those who have been misled by the devil, and Allah takes their souls, the first thing that they will call out and say is, Oh God, let me go back. That's the first thing they Because they know where they're headed. That they're off the path and going to hell. And this is a situation that Allah describes in the Quran. And He goes on to describe that individual after saying, Oh God, let me back. 
لعلني اعمل صالحا If you let me go back, I will go and do some good. However, Allah says, Kalla inna kalimatun wukahil. It's just the word that he's saying. It's a lie. If you let him go back, he's going back and doing the same thing that he was doing. He's going to end up in the same situation. This is a warning to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described this state, this circumstance as a warning to us. That we do not allow ourselves to be caught in such a situation. Sure, death will catch us when we least expect it. But let us not be caught in such a way that we will be begging to go back, begging to get a chance to do some good because we have done no good. This is the message here. Of course, none of us can be assured of paradise. We cannot be certain. We strive to do whatever good we can. And we're doing some evil deeds along with it. But Allah has promised in the Hasanat is his that say yes. So we have a chance. Good deeds erase evil deeds. So we try to do as much good as we can. So at least when our soul is taken, we're not caught in this situation. And good deeds are the deeds which are pleasing to Allah. The deeds which have been defined by the Messenger of Allah as being good deeds. Not necessarily what we perceive or what we imagine to be good. The criterion for determining good and evil is the way of the Messenger of Allah. He came and described it for us. So we need to know what are the good deeds so that we may do them. And know that in doing them that they are pleasing to Allah. However, there is one point that we can be sure of. No matter what the deeds that we do, whatever good deed that the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has described for us, in his actions or in his saying. For it to be considered a good deed to Allah, relative to us, it must be done with ikhlas, with sincerity. It has to be done from our heart. And that comes to what we are doing here tonight. We are here praying to our leaders. If this is just a ritual movement that we go through during Ramadan, be sure that they are not good deeds. They are not acceptable to Allah. They will only be acceptable to Allah if we do them from our hearts. If we make these prayers sincerely from our hearts, Glorifying Allah. Those of us who do not understand Arabic, and this is a problem. Our Imam is reciting. And the verse is so powerful that it moves him to tears. And half of us here don't even know what he's saying. What it is that has moved this man to tears. So it's very important for us who don't know Arabic to try and learn Arabic so that we may also be moved to tears crying for the sake of Allah crying because of what we might find ourselves in but at least if we don't understand what the Imam is saying at least here in the Quran we reflect on Allah and we try to glorify Him within ourselves. Don't let the recitation go on and our minds are thinking about the iftar, the nice food we ate, what we plan to do after we leave. Let not our minds go away. But try to 
to reflect on Allah and glorify Him, give thanks to Him. So brothers and sisters, let us try our best, if we are not already striving, to put some life into our ibadah, into our worship. Bring it to life. Make it from our hearts. Let it become a living practice which can have an effect on us. Thank you.